What's up guys? It's me, your favorite YouTuber, Dunning Kruger, and I already know everything about photography, so all of my pictures are sharp. My f-stop is f22, you're not gonna get me there. My shutter speed is so high, it's higher than Snoop Dogg, okay? I've got stabilized lenses, I've got a stabilized center, I got everything figured out. Just kidding, it's me, Chelsea. And I don't know why people call my humor cringe, but I do know why your photos are not sharp, and we're gonna cover it. And I and I'm I'm gonna have Tony. I'm gonna Tony help me. We have 15 reasons that your photos might be blurry. Whether you're an amateur or a complete pro, I promise you have not seen some of these reasons. They include problems with your camera, problems with your lens, and problems with you. First, a word from our sponsor, Squarespace. No matter what type of website you need, Squarespace is perfect. It's perfect for your photography portfolio, your video reel, your business, your restaurant, your dental office, whatever it is, head to squarespace.com slash Chelsea. You'll see how easy it is to make a beautiful professional website. You'll get detailed analytics, a store, you can take appointments from clients. Just try it out. Squarespace.com slash Chelsea. And when you love it, use the coupon code Chelsea and you'll get 10% off. Let's get into those reasons and we'll start with some of the most common ones and then we'll work to ones that are less common. I've made one recently. The first major problem is camera shake. You'll know camera shake in your pictures because the entire image has a little bit of motion. Single dots will turn into little lines both in the foreground and the background. There are a lot of ways to combat camera shake. The most popular is image stabilization. Most lenses and many camera bodies have stabilization built into them but you need to make sure that it's on because I've definitely accidentally turned it off and had a whole set of pictures ruined and there's no like alarm that goes off to tell you. I think the easiest thing is knowing to set your shutter speed higher. You may think that, you know, the reciprocal rule, which is when your lens focal length is about the same as your shutter speed. So like if you're at 50 millimeters, you would at least be at 1 50th for a shutter speed. If you already know the reciprocal rule, you should try to unlearn it because it's deeply flawed in the modern era. First, it doesn't factor in sensor or lens stabilization at all. It also doesn't factor in these new super sharp lenses and high resolution bodies that we have. Even if you're using a completely unstabilized rig, I find they often have to shoot at two, four, or even eight times the reciprocal rule to always get sharp shots. That's really true. I moved from a 24 megapixel camera to like a 45 megapixel camera and I thought something was wrong because my pictures all had camera shake. It was the higher resolution sensor that meant I had to bump up the shutter speed. And then there's also the fact that as an individual you're going to vary. So Tony is more stable. He has a more stable hand and so he can shoot at a lower shutter speed than I can. I know I always have to bump up above the reciprocal rule. And another thing to consider that's gotten me is that you might not be in an environment that's stable. So I've been on a second floor that was shaky and my camera's on a tripod so I think my shutter speed can be lower and that's not true. There are environmental factors like being on a bridge with cars going past, being in a studio that's on a second floor with a wood floor, um, or even shooting out your window and resting on a car window where the engine's running so you're shaking imperceptibly. Consider those things. I have one rule that helps everybody and that's the rule of doubles. I have an entire video on it. Basically, you put your camera into a continuous shutter and start taking pictures at the reciprocal rule. Take 10 pictures and then double your shutter speed to, so it's twice as long and double the number of pictures you take. And soon you'll be taking 30, 40, 50 pictures. You don't have to sort through everything when you process the images. Start at the last picture and go through them until you find one that's sharp and you'll know it's the best quality possible. See, camera shake is more complicated than you probably thought. There's a lot that you need to know. You might also have to learn how to press the shutter button differently. A lot of people just press the shutter button and that causes a twist in the camera. Lens stabilization cannot counteract that twist, though sensor stabilization can help. A better way to do it is to put your finger on the shutter and just roll it onto the shutter. Just gently roll it so that you don't twist the entire camera. Speaking of the shutter button, you might also have to learn how to not press the shutter button, mean, meaning you might want to put on a timer or use like a remote timer if you're doing a long exposure on a tripod. Just pressing the shutter for a long exposure could be enough to shake your, your camera, so keep that in mind. When you do press the shutter button, put your camera into continuous and always take at least three shots. The first and last shots are likely going to be impacted by you pressing the shutter, but the middle shot should be cleaner. If you happen to be using a smartphone, modern smartphones have some sort of image stabilization built in. Often they will take 8, 10, 20 pictures and only choose the sharpest photos. So if you're getting camera shake in your smartphone pictures, it might be time to upgrade to the latest smartphone. 
Okay, related to camera shake is motion blur. So this isn't your camera moving, but it's the subject moving. You'll be able to tell if it's motion blur versus camera shake if your background is completely sharp, but your subject is blurred in some way. And that's a similar problem. It might be that your shutter speed is too slow. Motion blur is a common problem in portraits because even though people might be standing still, they're actually moving just a little bit. And if they happen to move while the shutter is open, the picture is gonna be blurry. You can fix that, again, by just using continuous shutter, rattling off several pictures, and then picking the sharpest one as you review them. Of course, you could solve this by setting your shutter to one four thousandth of a second, and then you would always eliminate any sort of motion blur. But if you do that, then your camera will be forced to use a really high ISO to get the proper exposure. And that high ISO will actually ruin sharpness, as we'll talk about in just a little bit. The next one is missed focus, and this one seems easy, but it's actually pretty complicated. It's when some part of your photo is in focus, but it's not the part that you want. And I get people writing me about this one where they'll say, why is my subject's face blurry? And you have to look around the photo to see, oh, it's their toe that's in focus, not the face. Now, this one can be challenging because you can think that you nail focus when you're taking the picture. You can even zoom in to the back of your screen but a lot of cameras don't have a screen with very good resolution, so you might have to actually get the photo to your computer before you realize, oh, the front eye wasn't in focus, the nose was, or the lips were, but not the eyes, or something else. Especially if you're working with a camera that has a super shallow depth of field, like an F2 or F2.8 lens, it's very easy for this to happen. Here are some ways to mitigate that problem. You can shoot in continuous shooting mode, AFC, and take multiple pictures. Make sure that you're moving your point of focus around and recomposing and take a lot of pictures to give you different options. I know some people think this is like spray and pray or a cheap trick to take a lot of photos, but it never hurts to be prepared. So try taking many photos, especially if you have an older camera that doesn't have as good as a focusing system. Also consider that if you're using third party lenses, they might not be communicating with your camera as well. And so autofocus might be more difficult or it might not be as accurate what is what I'm trying to say. So take many photos to give it a better chance of getting a good hit rate. We test autofocus on cameras all the time when we review new gear and old gear. And sometimes the hit rate is lower than 50%. That means we'll take 10 photos and only five are in focus or four are in focus. So keep that in mind, take many pictures, focus and recompose, use AFC continuous mode, and that should help you get more pictures in focus. Also consider that the center autofocus point tends to be the most accurate, uh, so keep that in mind. You can also run into a problem where one subject is in focus and the other is out of focus. This is because of depth of field. When you focus on something, you can only focus on one part of the picture at a time, and this is a flat focal plane. It's two-dimensional parallel to the sensor, so if you have two subjects in the scene and one of them is a little in front of or behind the other, the other one's gonna be out of focus and that's frustrating. The solution to this is pretty simple. Set your camera to aperture priority mode and use a higher f-stop number until you're really satisfied that both subjects are sharp. You might have to zoom in on the back of your camera and check the eyes of every person in the scene. Using a higher f-stop number isn't always the solution though, because using a higher f-stop number reduces the light that's getting to your lens and that itself can reduce sharpness. Additionally, using a very high f-stop number like f16, f22 introduces something called diffraction. Diffraction is this property of the physics of photons, those little particles of light and the way they bend around the aperture inside the lens. That scatters them and always reduces the sharpness on every camera where you use a small aperture. So a higher f-stop number increases the depth of field, making the background sharper. It actually makes the foreground a little bit less sharp. Both these pictures are focused on the lighthouse. You can see at f2.8, the foreground is completely blurry. At f22, the foreground is actually much sharper. But zoom in on the actual focal point. Sharpness is lower on the picture at f22 because of two factors, diffraction and gathering less light. But if your goal was to get the foreground in focus too, then clearly f22 was the better choice. Your lenses have a sweet spot, which is usually one or two stops higher than the lowest possible f-stop number, and that will give you the sharpest pictures 
at the focal plane. I see this problem a lot when people are doing group photos for families. And so the answer would not be to just crank it up to F16 or F22. You wanna actually try to arrange people into a focal plane. And that's why you're getting people to stand closer together or move their faces into the same focal plane while still being natural, of course, and then using a larger f-stop number without it being so big that you're reducing sharpness. So there's some playing around that you might have to do. And like the other tips we mentioned, don't be afraid to take a lot of photos. Take multiple photos and make sure you have a higher chance of getting your picture sharp. Yeah, I did this because my tip is the back row, you should have them lean forward a little bit and try to get them as close like to the a as possible. <laughs> like a creep. <laughs> If you love taking pictures of animals like I do, you've probably noticed that when you try to crop, suddenly your photo is not so sharp anymore. And that's because you're losing resolution if you're cropping. And that happens a lot if you're cropping on your smartphone too. You know when you pinch to zoom to take a photo and suddenly everything looks really bad. It's because when you crop your photo, you're losing resolution. And there are several ways to solve this. Now with wildlife, you can solve it by getting a longer lens. This is actually an 800 millimeter lens, even though it's small because it's an F11 lens. And this allows me to fill the frame with my subject when I'm taking the picture so that I don't have to crop later. And that's allowing me to save the resolution and have a sharper photo. Another solution is to just get closer to your subject. If you can't get a long lens, you can't afford one, or you just don't have one, then you need to camp out for a wildlife picture and wait until things get close to you. Or if you're trying to take a landscape picture of a distant lighthouse or some distant feature, and it's just not coming out very great, maybe you need to find a new vantage point or find a longer lens or use a teleconverter so that you can turn your, let's say 70 to 200 into almost a 400 millimeter lens. Another solution is to have a higher megapixel camera. So if you go from a 24 to a 45 megapixel camera, you'll have more resolution if you crop, but the caveat to that is that you have to have a very sharp lens. The high resolution of your sensor is not going to do much for you if you have a soft lens. You've got to make sure that you have the two working as a pair. While I'm shooting with this long lens, I should mention that air quality is something that will ruin your photos. And I've gotten emails about it. I've gotten emails about this specific lens that they did not think it was sharp. And it's because they were shooting through haze. So the subject actually was in focus. It's just that the air quality was ruining the photo. We know this intuitively. If you go out and take pictures on a foggy day, you know the photos won't be sharp. But it can also happen if there's haze rising off of the ground or if it's the morning and the cold ground is being heated by the sun, then you might get a rising haze. It's also happened to me if I'm shooting from a warm place into a cold place, like I've shot out my door on a winter's day and the warm air from the house mixes with the cold air outside and ruins the image quality of the photo. So keep in mind the atmosphere that you're shooting through. And it doesn't mean you can't shoot on a foggy day or a hazy day or a rainy day. It just means that you have to get closer to your subject so that there's less atmosphere between you and the subject ruining the photo. Here's kind of a cool nerdy tip. That's the reason that huge telescopes are on top of the mountains because there's actually just less atmosphere up there. And so they're not trying to shoot through the weather to get a picture far off in outer space. Okay, here's another one while we're outside. Hard light, like I'm in right now, will give you a lot of detail because it's gonna show a lot of texture, but soft light is going to make things seem not as sharp. So I'll show you an example on, on my birdhouse that's desperately in need of some help. Uh, let me take a picture first in hard light before it goes away. And now Tony put the diffuser over it. And you can see the difference here in hard light, you have a more drastic variation between the shadows and the highlights. And so things are appearing sharper and soft light, it's appearing more soft. So keep that in mind. When it comes to portraits, a lot of people want everyone in soft light because it does reduce the bumps on your face. Uh, it is a little bit more flattering, but it can also just make everything look flat in a bad way. A way to help that is to put the person in softer light and then pop a flash so you get a bit of highlight. How can your photos possibly be sharp if the glass that you're shooting through is filthy? I see this problem the most with smartphones because we're always handling them and accidentally touching the lenses and then trying to shoot through these greasy fingerprints. The same thing can happen with your lens. You have to make sure that it's clean, there isn't water on the front, and use a proper little cloth to buff it and make sure that it's nice and clear so that your photos can be sharp. Another thing is that it might look clean and there's a smudge and it's diffracting the light into your lens and making a uh, like little strange highlights and things like that that reduce the sharpness. So have a clean lens 
and then you'll have sharper photos. Also keep in mind that if you're shooting through cheap glass, then your photos won't be as sharp. So if you're using cheap filters and putting them over your lens, that could be a problem. If you're shooting through a glass window, that's obviously going to reduce sharpness, even if you think it's really clean. So make sure you're shooting through very high quality clean filters. Make sure that your lens glass is clean and make sure that you're not shooting through windows, car windows, home windows, anything like that. I know all of this stuff can seem a little bit complicated, but you know what's really simple is making your very own Squarespace website. In fact, I was able to just drag and drop photos into my website and make it in about 10 minutes. It's just that easy. And if you don't believe me, you can try it for free. No credit card needed. They'll give you a 14 day free trial to see if you like it. Just go to squarespace.com slash Chelsea. And when you decide you like it, and I know you will, use the coupon code Chelsea to get 10% off. That's C-H-E-L-S-E-A. Thank you, Squarespace. This is a teleconverter. This is the camera, the lens, the teleconverter goes in between and it essentially does an in-camera crop. It takes half the image area in the case of a 1.4 teleconverter or about a quarter of the image area in the case of a 2x teleconverter and spreads that image out across the entire sensor. This can really improve your image quality in the case where you have a very sharp lens and a low resolution body. However, in other situations, the teleconverter will actually lower your image quality. If your lens is slow, like an F5.6 lens, or not that sharp, you'll see actually lower resolution. You might be better off just cropping. If you have a high resolution body, like this 45 megapixel body, with no AA filter especially, the teleconverter might actually be hindering you. There's no universal rule that will tell you whether you could benefit from a teleconverter or not because there's so many permutations of cameras and lenses and the best I can suggest is getting or renting or borrowing a teleconverter, trying it out, shoot a still subject with and without the teleconverter and then crop in so they have the same angle of view. You might decide that it's better just to crop rather than using the teleconverter. Photographers are often shooting into the sun. Anytime you're shooting a sunrise or sunset, you're shooting into the sun. And when you shoot in heavily backlit situations like this, you're creating a very high contrast scene where the background is much brighter than the foreground. If your lens is not a professional grade lens, the contrast could end up ruining your picture. What happens is this heavy light behind me gets into the lens and bounces around and this reduces sharpness. Even with many professional lenses, it noticeably reduces sharpness. We often shoot with backlight. Sometimes it's the sun behind the model and that creates a whole lot of contrast and the old lens handled that just terribly and it was a constant problem and it limited our options. I mean, we really just couldn't shoot with the sun behind the model like that, especially in the frame because it would just wash out the entire shot. I didn't expect the difference to be this dramatic though. I actually thought I'd made a mistake and I'd up the output from the light. But no, those shots have the same settings, the same light output. The new lens just handles contrast so much more that it dramatically changed the shot. So how do you solve this? Well, you could add front lighting. So the difference between the front and the back isn't so great. This minimizes contrast. You could also switch to a professional grade lens, maybe one that we've tested for contrast because then you'll know what you're going to get and it opens up the opportunity to shoot into the sun when you absolutely need to. Another common cause of unsharp pictures is unsharp lenses. And that seems obvious, but you'd be surprised how many people are using kit lenses still. The kit lens is really optimized for the manufacturer's profit and I've never found a single kit lens that performed anywhere near what the higher end lenses perform like. That doesn't mean that you have to break the bank buying a new lens, but it does mean you can go shopping for a lens that you know is going to be sharp and that might be a prime like 50 millimeter lens that gets good reviews and you can even buy that used. So you don't have to spend a ton of money to get a sharp lens. Another common mistake I see people make is that they put a good full frame lens on an APS-C body. I'm putting both of these on a Sony a6600 and APS-C camera. On the left, we have the non-professional G lens and on the right, we have the professional grade GM lens. This is the more expensive lens on the right. Looking closer to the edge of the frame, I can see distinctly more detail out of the APS-C non-professional lens than I do out of the professional grade full frame lens. And I know there's a mythology out there about only using the center of the lens and getting sharper images because of that. But in our actual testing of dozens of lenses side by side, 
we find full frame lenses almost always underperform APS-C counterparts. Now it's gonna depend on the specific example you're talking about, but generally you're better off getting a good APS-C lens for your APS-C body or upgrading your body to full frame if you really wanna use those full frame lenses. Another factor is ISO or basically using higher ISO because that reduces the overall sharpness of your image. It's not the ISO itself. You can't solve the problem by simply using a lower ISO and underexposing your pictures. The problem is a lack of light. The sensor isn't gathering enough photons and there ends up being little gaps where it doesn't have enough photons and basically noise reduction just sort of makes stuff up. And that's why your high ISO, low light images end up looking all smudgy. Now you can solve that by adding more light or you can check and see if your aperture is too high for some reason. You might have it set high like f8 and you don't need that much depth of field but you need more light. Stop it down as much as you can to something like f28 if that's possible. You can also get a faster lens. For example, getting an f2.8 lens instead of an f5.6 lens or switching to an f1.4 prime. If you've already maxed out the lenses and you're going as low as you can, then upgrading to a bigger sensor can help if you keep the f-stop number the same. What I don't wanna see is you switching from f2.8 on an APS-C body to f4 on a full frame body. People do that and you don't get better results because using a slower lens on a full frame body will not solve the problem. For low light and portraits, a fast lens with a low f-stop number helps more than a high-end body. Also, the more expensive lens gave us better background blur, which is great for separating your model from the background in portraits. The last point is really nerdy, and that is micro adjustments. There is this thing where in the DSLR world, sensors could become slightly misaligned with their focusing points and thus every picture you took could be focusing a little bit in front of or a little bit behind the focal plane and you would just always be missing focus. And so manufacturers, to allow people to solve this themselves, started building in these micro adjustments. People find this and they start tuning it and they end up actually throwing their camera more out of focus. Yeah, and maybe it didn't even need to be micro adjusted. Maybe it's one of these other reasons that we listed and people are assuming that their gear is faulty. I've talked to tech support at two different lens manufacturers and both people told me that one of the most common problems they get is people added micro adjustments when they didn't need it. You almost never need micro adjustments on DSLRs and you absolutely never need it on mirrorless cameras and you never need it when using live view on a DSLR. Basically don't be so fast with the micro adjustments is probably hurting more than it's helping. Talking about one more nerdy thing, Tony, we should mention the AA filter that sometimes comes on sensors. Or called an OLPF, optical low pass filter or anti-aliasing filter. It's there to reduce moiré, which is the weird color fringing that you might see on tight knit fabrics. Yeah, it's when someone wears fine pinstripes or a plaid shirt and it looks kind of funny like an optical illusion. The AA filter can reduce that or eliminate that, but it can also reduce sharpness. And that's something that you'll want to consider if you're shooting something like wildlife where we had a camera's AA filter that was very thick make our wildlife photos less sharp. The cheaper Nikon combination produced sharper and cleaner results in a variety of different settings. The sharper probably comes from the lack of an AA filter on the Nikon. I look for cameras that don't have an AA filter, but at the same time, I have tested cameras that technically have an AA filter, but it doesn't ruin sharpness. So some like the Canon 7D and 7D Mark II had really heavy AA filters. Yeah. The 1DX series, heavy AA filters, D5. But then there are other cameras that have really light AA filters like the Sony a7 IV. Has an AA filter, but it's not that bad. Something to consider. If you're gonna be shooting something like astrophotography, you either don't want one or you want a very light one. And so consider that as well for one of the nerdy things. We hope these tips have been helpful. In the comments down below, I'd love to hear your own tips on getting sharp images. When did you get blurry images and what did you do to fix them? It can be really complex as we've kind of covered here. I think troubleshooting is kind of fun. We get a lot of emails where people say, hey, you recommended this lens and now it looks blurry. And sometimes it's atmospheric conditions or sometimes it's camera shake or motion blur or missed focus. But it's never our fault. That's the important thing to know. Our recommendations 100% spot on. Thank, Thank you, you Squarespace for making this podcast possible. If you want your very own website and you want it to be easy, way easier than getting sharp pictures, check out Squarespace because if you can drag and drop 
can put your photos in. It puts it in a beautiful template. The templates are easy to change and it's fast. Anyone can do it. Go to squarespace.com slash Chelsea. And if you like it after that 14 day free trial, use the coupon code Chelsea to get 10% off. That's C-H-E-L-S-E-A. Thank you for watching and see you next time. Bye.